Good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening, but welcome to all out there watching and listening wherever, whatever time it may be. God is here among us, just as God promised. But to be honest, sometimes with everything that's been going on around us, and now we even hear more about a second wave of the coronavirus, and it's already been six months apart. And because of a recent death of a friend of mine, things are feeling a bit chaotic within me and around me. And I do question God. I do cry out to God. And in the midst of this, I was thinking about the call to worship for today for a series on images of the church as a tent, as an aroma, and today as a letter. While I was asking and listening for God's words of consolation, I came across this poem by Jan Richardson. It felt like a love letter from God. I hope it's like that for you too. It's called Blessing in the Chaos. To all that is chaotic in you, let there come silence. Let there be a calming of the clamoring, a stilling of the voices that have laid their claim on you, that have made their home in you, that go with you even to the holy places, but will not let you rest, will not let you hear your life with wholeness or feel the grace that fashioned you. Let what distracts you cease. Let what divides you cease. Let there come an end to what diminishes and demeans, and let depart all that keeps you in its cage. Let there be an opening into the quiet that lies beneath the chaos, 
where you find the peace you did not think possible and see what shimmers within the storm. Let us pray. Creator God, loving Jesus, Holy Spirit, come to us within the storm. Change us, challenge us, renew and transform us through your word. Let the chaos become calmness within us. Bless Janet as she brings your message written on her heart. We await your word, your spirit, and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bible reading is from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33 from the NRSV. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. from the tomb. 
kids. I just came out this morning. I wanted to see if I um, got some mail. Oh, I do, yes. Let me look. Oh, usually the things I get are mostly advertisements and bills. But look, I've got a letter sent to me. You know, we don't do letters very much that just get sent here. Because I remember years ago when my husband and I, we were in Europe in, um, with Intermeno, an MCC program, and we started dating there. But he was in France and then in Switzerland, and, and I was in the Netherlands. And he sent me a handwritten letter almost every day for several months after we started dating. It was so exciting to go see that because we did not have any email, no computers to do that. So I had to wait, but it was great. I didn't do as many to him though. And when we were away and had our first baby in Thailand, my parents had to wait for weeks to get um, pictures of our baby and things. So now, we just don't have that as much. So this is so exciting. I got a letter to me. Let me see what it's about. Oh, it's a personal one. This is beautiful. It has a tree on the front for fall. Dear Shirley, hello. I hope you're having a good day. I miss seeing you regularly at church. I'm glad you started coming to the SJMC. You bring lots of energy and fun to our church, and you remind us that God loves everybody, no matter where in the world they are from. I have enjoyed getting to know you better. I'm glad you are my friend. Sincerely, your SJMC friend, Janet. Oh, that is so special. I hope she knows how special that is. I have to let her know. It just makes it so much more personal. And another one. This one says, please share this with the children at SJMC. Let's see what this one is that I got. This is to you. Look, it's got a really neat thing on it from House of Friendship. I used to work there. This says, oh, dear SJMC children and friends who have joined us today. Hello, how are you? Many of you have started school again either at home or at your school. We hope you're feeling safe and happy. We miss seeing you at church. We miss hearing your voices and listening to your ideas at children's time. You are a special part of our church family. We want you to remember that God loves and cares for each one of you. We hope you are enjoying this beautiful fall season and God's amazing creation. God bless each one of you with love from your friends at St. Jacob's Mennonite Church. Oh, I hope that made you feel special too, just like the other card did to me. It really does something to have a special card just written out by hand, you know, and that's a way of sharing God's love with all the people around. And sometimes when they're hurting and some people have to stay inside now a lot of the time, if they're not, if they're sick or something with worried about the flu, so, do you know, maybe you could be God's, God's letter, too, to somebody, and you can send a card to them, too. Maybe you can go after the service today and or during and write a card to somebody special and mail it to them in the mail because you see how special that can be to people. That's great. I hope you guys are having a good time and blessings to all of you. God loves you. Bye. Here at St. Jacob's, we have a tradition of offering gifts to children and youth as milestone markers along the way of their growing up in this congregation. To children who are two years old and just beginning their lifelong adventure of faith formation, we offer a board book about God's love for them. To children entering grade three, we offer a full Bible geared to kids. And to our youth entering grade 9 and high school, we offer a youth study Bible. We hope that these gifts might continue the process of treasuring, discovering, and exploring scripture through all the stages of life. 
One of the sad limitations of our recorded worship these days is that we can't all gather around these children and youth in person to make the presentations. But we will still acknowledge the, the milestones here in our worship and then deliver the books and Bibles individually over the course of the next week or so. Even in our scattered distance, we remain the church family that surrounds these young people and offers our blessing on their growing lives of faith. So, we have two two-year-olds who are receiving a board book today. They are Lena and Theo. We thank God for both of you and pray for much joy and enthusiasm as you continue to explore your worlds. There are also four children entering grade three to whom we offer a children's Bible. They are Karina, Lucy, Anna Joy, and Daniel. We pray that as you continue to read more and more, you might find adventure, inspiration, and truth in these Bibles. And finally, we have four youth who are starting the journey of high school this year in grade nine. They are Levi, Sean, Bertha, and Alice. May these study Bibles help you navigate the big questions that come with your growing maturity in faith and life. We are proud of the people you are becoming and we welcome your emerging voices among us. Now, usually these study Bibles would have been out on the foyer for a few weeks so that the rest of us could sign our names in them or maybe highlight some of our favorite passages. And that's been a nice way of personalizing the gift and remembering your connection as youth with this larger church community. We can't do that very easily this year, but I am going to encourage anyone who feels so led to send those greetings or well wishes or favorite passages, perhaps, to these youth by email or in some other way. It would be great to still share some of these things with these youth. And if you don't have the email address or contact for a youth or their family, you can feel free to send your greetings to me at kevin at sjmc.on.ca and I'll make sure they get passed along. Thank you to the whole community for being part of these important milestones. May God bless our growing congregation. What is my image of the church? We all have a slightly different image of the church. Mine was originally shaped by my experience and later by the words of the Bible. There are many references in the Bible to the church being the body of Christ. Colossians 1.24 ends with, For the sake of Christ's body, which is the church. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So my image of the church is that it is the body of Christ. Also, as members, we personally accept the body of Christ, we spend our Christian journey emulating and living the image of Christ. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So the church is the body, and through God's grace, we are alive in Christ as parts of the body. Romans 12.5 says, we are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 
So we come from different walks of life. We all have different stories, but we are individually members of one another. We are one in Christ. When I first came to services at St. Jacob's Mennonite, I was warmly and well and lovingly greeted in the foyer by members, the good old days. Some of the people I knew and many I didn't know or remember, but all gave me a friendly greeting and some offered that I could sit with them. To me, it expressed the love of the church. I would like to take this opportunity to offer my appreciation and thanks for an experience that fulfilled my image of the church. Thank you and thank you God for the gift of the church. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength, with all your mind and strength. You praise the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength, with all your mind and strength. With all your mind and strength. With all your praise the Lord. I will sing to the Lord while I have been. I will set my mind on things above. I will pray in the Spirit without ceasing. I will fill my heart with truth and love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength. With all your that all it is written, praise the Lord your God with all your heart. And soul with all your mind and strength, let all that is within you praise the Lord. Find your strength in walking with the Spirit, find your heart in Christ's unchanging love. Seek the length and breadth of depth of wisdom, fill your soul with the fullness of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength. With all your Let all that is within you praise the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength. Let all that is within you praise the Lord. Let the lives we live reflect God's glory. Let the love we share reflect God's grace. May we walk in truth and understanding. May we grow in wisdom all our days. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength. With all your Let all that is within you praise the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength. Let all that is within you praise the Lord. Our second Bible reading is from 2 Corinthians 3, 1 to 6, and this is taken from the message. Does it sound like we're patting ourselves on the back, insisting on our credentials, asserting our authority? Well, we're not. Neither do we need letters of endorsement, either to you or from you. You yourselves are all the endorsement we need. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit, not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives, and we publish it. We couldn't be more sure of ourselves in this, that you, written by Christ himself for God, are our letter of recommendation. We wouldn't think of writing this kind of letter about ourselves. Only God can write such a letter. His letter authorizes us to help carry out this new plan of action. The plan wasn't written out with ink on paper, with pages and pages of legal footnotes, killing your spirit. It's written with spirit, on spirit, his life on our lives. I remember sitting on the carpet in my grade one classroom, listening to my teacher, Mrs. McGinnis, read aloud to us. My favorite was Charlotte's Web. 
the story of the young girl Fern who rescues a runt pig from the litter, names him Wilbur, and takes care of him herself. When Wilbur moves to the Zuckerman farm down the road to live in the barn cellar, Fern hangs out there whenever she can with Wilbur and the other animals, and witnesses how Charlotte the spider saves Wilbur's life from the inevitable fate of a spring pig. Listening to Mrs. McGinnis read was magic. She had a different voice for each character. I loved listening to her silky smooth voice for Charlotte the spider, her know-it-all attitude for the old sheep, her nonchalant indifference of Templeton the rat, and her naive innocent voice for Wilbur the pig. She brought that story to life. The next year, Mrs. McGinnis became our school librarian, and I have other special memories of sitting at her feet in the library, listening to her read James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl, and Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. Mrs. McGinnis knew the power of words to capture our imagination, ignite our, to capture our attention, ignite our imaginations, and touch our hearts. As I learned to read, I remember the feeling of wonder that these black lines and squiggles on a page had meaning and power. They could transport me out of my small world to other times and places and adventures. And when I could read Charlotte's Web for myself or Anne of Green Gables or every book I could find about girls and horses like my friend Flicka, and I could read them over and over again, I was captivated by the power of words, something that has never left me. As a teacher, it was one of my greatest joys to share the power of words and stories with my students, to see them get immersed in a novel we were reading and emotionally invested in the characters, or to watch them find just the right turn of phrase in a poem or story they were crafting. I liked the challenge of helping them to appreciate the elusive nature of words, how hard it is to communicate well, and to help them recognize the power of words to hurt or deceive or manipulate, but also the power of words to inspire, to motivate, to heal, and to challenge. The biblical story also reflects the power and importance of words. Here's just a few examples. At creation, the spirit or wisdom of God hovered over the waters, and God spoke the words of creation, and it was so. All 176 verses of Psalm 119 are dedicated to honoring the gift of God's word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, we read. When the Israelites found themselves in exile in Babylon, away from their land and their temple, they turned to preserving and recording their texts and stories as a way of surviving as a people. And then, of course, there are the texts we read this morning. In the Jeremiah passage, we hear about a new covenant written on the heart. The prophet is responding to the devastation of the exile when the people lose their land, their traditions, their customs, and their temple. It seems that even God has abandoned them. But Jeremiah offers them a word of hope. God is willing to make a new covenant with them, but this covenant will be different. It will be written on their hearts. In the second Corinthians passage from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, we read that the church itself is a letter written by the Spirit of God on human hearts. In Corinth, Paul finds himself criticized and compared to super apostles who made a great show and performance out of their preaching and teaching. Paul seems dull and ordinary by comparison. But Paul says, I don't need any letter of recommendation to boost my credentials. You are my letter. You, the church in Corinth, are all the endorsement I need to prove that the gospel I preach is authentic. Just look at your lives. They are like a letter written by Christ, not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of God, not carved on stone tablets, but written on human hearts. 
In both of the texts we heard this morning, the heart is important. The new covenant is written on the human heart. We, in our North American culture, tend to think of the heart in romantic and sentimental ways. But in the culture of the Bible, the heart meant much more than that. Your heart was the very core of your identity, your very essence, where your deepest desires and motivations came from, where you lived from. So if a word was written on your heart, it wasn't just a warm feeling. It was a part of you. We know that even the best words are no substitute for a lived experience. Words are only windows, a description, an expression of the real thing. When I read Charlotte's Web, I could delight in the story of a girl and her animal friends in my imagination. But even more delightful was the relationships I had with the very real animals I grew up with on the farm in my lived experience. In the same way we can read about another culture somewhere in the world and travel there in our imagination, but until we actually immerse ourselves with our five senses in that culture, we can't fully experience it. John begins his gospel with these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on he says, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. The Word, the wisdom, the blueprint of God came and lived among us. Isn't that the key? The Word took on a body, hands and feet, arms and legs, ears and eyes, and a heart, living, breathing, and loving. The true Word is not content to be an idea, to be in the imagination. The true word is dynamic and alive. For a word to have meaning, it needs to live. So what does this metaphor have to teach us about being the church? What does it mean for the church to be a word, a letter, written by the Spirit of God on human hearts? What does it mean to have God's covenant written on our hearts? There are lots of ways to explore this, and I hope we can hear some of your ideas in the worship response time later this morning. Here are a few ideas to get us started. First of all, I think it is a call to live and embody our faith. This isn't just about our heads or our beliefs. To have the covenant written on our hearts makes it our own and makes it a part of all that we are and all that we do. To be a letter that others can read makes our lives an example for others to follow. Discipleship is comfortable territory for Mennonites. We like to think of ourselves as those who put our faith into action, who walk the talk. We emphasize following the life and teachings of Jesus and tend to read our Bibles through a Jesus lens. But if we're learning anything from the black and indigenous people who are protesting and calling for justice, there is room for the church to step up. Black activist, writer, and theologian Drew Hart, in his book, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Views Racism, says that the church should inspire and lead the transformational change our society needs. And he sees the subversive life of Jesus as the way out of our racialized and hierarchical society. Drew reminds us that Jesus was poor. He was part of an oppressed minority living under occupation. He spent his early years as a refugee with his parents fleeing danger. And in his ministry, Jesus aligns himself with the least of these, gathered from the margins of society. Jesus finds solidarity with the poor, with the oppressed, the vulnerable, the socially rejected and marginalized, and with the outcasts. The kind of life that Jesus lived was grassroots and subversive, Drew says, a direct threat to the social, political, religious, and economic establishment. His life and ministry undermined the powers, yet without ever swinging a sword. In following Jesus, Drew says, God's people will find an alternative response to the oppressive structures in our society. Drew calls it Jesus-shaped solidarity. 
that can create Jesus-shaped communities. He calls on us to develop scripture-soaked social imagination by immersing ourselves in the biblical narrative's subversive and prophetic window into our world. Never has it been more important to drench ourselves in the story of scripture, he says, which will renew our minds and empower us to resist the currents of racial conformity in our world. Drew dares us to read, hear, and live out this story, to live what he calls Jesus-shaped lives, so that we can be part of how God's Spirit is at work, transforming, restoring, liberating, and empowering people. Second, having God's covenant written on our hearts makes it personal, makes it our own. It takes root at the very core of who we are. This is about a relationship with God that needs to be nurtured and tended. Last winter, we did a worship series on healthy relationships. We began with our relationship to God as the foundation for all the others. One of the translations of the text we read today says, I will write it deep within them. God has imprinted God's very likeness and image into the heart of who we are. And it is out of that deep grounding in the love of God that we live our lives. I think there is a need today for people with depth, who are wise and discerning, people who can lead and live from a place of deep grounding in the love and compassion of God, so that they are not easily shaken by fear or misled or manipulated. These are people who can hold the pain and anxiety of our world, but also live from a place of creative hope. Think for a moment about someone you look to as a role model who is grounded and centered in the love of God, someone you know who embodies Jesus, who lives with the Spirit of God imprinted on their heart and on their life. What can you learn from that person? And how is your soul being fed? What nurtures and grounds you? What inspires and empowers you to be an accomplice working for peace and justice for the most vulnerable among us? and for our planet. Third, both of the texts we read today talk about a new covenant. It's an invitation to be changed, to be transformed, to be reborn. If we have the imprint of God's love written on our hearts, that transforms us. We are certainly living in a time of change and upheaval. It's not very likely that we will ever get back to normal, whatever that means. And that can be scary. There is danger and pain and suffering from this pandemic. There is also opportunity in this very unsettling situation. Some people are calling it a wake-up call, especially for Western capitalist cultures. As so many people have pointed out, the old way of living together as a society didn't work very well for a lot of people. Precarious workers in the gig economy, long-term care home workers and residents, and for a long time now, black, indigenous, and other people of color who have been oppressed, devalued, and marginalized. Can we shape some kind of new normal? Lots of people are hopeful that we can do better. Many people are insisting that we must do better. Can we shape our society to be more compassionate, inclusive, and generous? Do we have the courage? Transforming society starts with ourselves. We have to do our own inner work, taking a long, hard look at our attitudes and assumptions about various groups of people. Where do those attitudes come from? What has shaped our assumptions? What motivates our behavior? What are we afraid of? In what ways are we in the church being called to re-examine old assumptions and behaviors? How does that make us feel? Do we have the courage to begin to shift and change, seeking always to become more Christ-like? 
Here again, there's an opportunity for the church and for people of faith to model something amazing. I had the privilege recently of interviewing Fanosi Lagasse for an article in an upcoming issue of the Canadian Mennonite. In March, Fanosi took on a new role called Intercultural Minister at our regional church body, Mennonite Church Eastern Canada. His job was created because intercultural awareness is described as a growing edge for our regional church. Over 20% of the 104 congregations are newcomer or first-generation Canadian, many made up of people who have experienced war, persecution, and suffering, and are finding healing in the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition with its emphasis on peace, justice, and community. Fanosi sees his job as helping this mosaic of people become the body of Christ. That's his image of the church. Fanosi acknowledges that being an intercultural church is not easy. Learning to listen to each other and live together is hard work. He grounds his vision of the church in Jesus, who taught without discrimination and proclaimed the good news for everybody. Fanosi says that becoming an intercultural church means a lot more than accepting one another, sharing food at a potluck, and singing a few songs in another language. It means interacting and sharing our gifts and resources with each other. It means sharing each other's burdens and praying for each other, processing, struggling, studying, and asking questions together. Fanosi imagines a church that allows the Holy Spirit to express worship, discipleship, and proclamation in many, many languages with joy with expectation and with urgency. He says that new churches are like a stream of water coming into the pool. It's stirring things up a bit, and that can be unsettling. But there's an invitation here for the church to be transformed. It's a little bit like Brent Hurst's description of the church as an orchestra. In the intercultural church, there are new instruments and unique sounds and glorious music. Words are powerful. The word, the covenant of God's love for us, has been written, imprinted on our hearts by the Spirit of God. So now we can be a letter of Christ to others. We can communicate God's love. We can share good news. We can offer encouragement. We can connect with those who are lonely. How else do you see yourself being a living letter of Christ to others? And maybe this week some of us will take the time to write a real letter or a note or a card or an email to someone we want to connect with, to offer God's love to someone in our church family we haven't seen for a while, or a relative or friend who lives far away, or someone close by who seems lonely and isolated. Words can be powerful. The word or covenant of God written on our hearts names us and claims us. It grounds us and inspires us to live Jesus-shaped lives.
My name is Trevor Bauman, and I chair the Staff Relations Committee at SJMC. This week, you as a congregation received a memo from Leadership Council and Staff Relations. The memo introduced the search committee members and their mandate to search for a 0.5 FTE pastor to replace the vacancy left with Wendy Jansen's departure from the pastoral team to work at MCC. The search committee has begun their work and are gathering information, putting together a congregation profile and connecting to MCEC. We know that this process takes time. So staff relations has hired Liz Weaver as an interim part-time basis to join the pastoral team with Mark and Kevin. She will provide support in the areas of Christian formation, youth ministry, worship, and tech support. We are excited for the energies and passions that Liz will bring to our congregation during this time. Liz, I invite you to say a few words of introduction before we have some words of installation. Thank you, Trevor. I would like to begin by saying that I am very excited for this opportunity and am beyond grateful to have been asked to join the pastoral team at SGMC. I am also excited to be working alongside Mark and Kevin while learning more about and living into how ministry is done. I have been attending SJMC for around three years now, and from the very first Sunday, I have felt welcomed and embraced by the community. I grew up at Florida Mennonite Church and was very involved in different volunteer opportunities there throughout my youth and young adult years. Um, after graduating university, I got a job at Mennonite Church Eastern Canada, Canada, where I got to see the many different ways that Mennonite churches in the area were practicing and living out their faith. During this time, I also started working part-time at Arts Abound, which is a children's art studio located in St. Jacobs, and eventually moved into more of a full-time role there, which ended this past summer. Um, I am looking forward to learning more about what it means to be a pastor, ministering to the community, and finding creative ways to connect with others in the congregation during these pandemic times. Um, as I said before, I'm very appreciative for this opportunity, and I'm excited to see what all it will entail. God provides a variety of gifts to equip us as followers of Jesus for the work of ministry in the world and to build up Christ's body, the church. Today, we covenant with Liz Weaver, celebrating her calling and commission to serve as interim pastor. Liz, we welcome you to our pastoral team, and we look forward to the gifts and passions that you'll bring. We commit to working together as a team and walking alongside of you as we follow God's leading together. And we want to bless you with wisdom and joy, strength and peace. May God lead all of us in the way of Jesus. Amen. Before we enter into a time of prayer, let us give thanks for the offerings that have been received and the gifts that have been shared. Thanks be to God. Um, for today's congregational prayer, I'm going to share a prayer that is written by Ina Hughes. It's called We Pray for Children, and the version I'm going to read is adapted by Dave and Jenny Sinos that they used at a Children and Youth Ministry Conference a number of years ago. So, we pray for children and youth. We pray for young people who put chocolate fingers everywhere, who like to be tickled, who stomp in puddles and ruin their new pants, who ask for $20 before they leave with their friends, who erase holes in math workbooks, and who never put away their shoes. And we pray for those who stare at photographs from behind barbed wire, who can't bound down the street in new sneakers, who never counted potatoes, who aren't anybody's Facebook friend, who are born in places we wouldn't be caught dead in, who never go to the circus or to a concert, and who live in an X-rated world. We pray for young people who bring us sticky kisses and fistfuls of dandelions, who sleep with the cat and bury goldfish, who hug us in a hurry and forget their lunch money, who leave makeup all over the sink, and who slurp their soup. And we pray for those who never get dessert, who never had a safe blanket to drag behind them, who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have any rooms or lockers to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's phones, and whose monsters are real. 
We pray for young people who spend all their paychecks before Tuesday, who throw tantrums in the grocery store and pick at their food, who like ghost stories, who stay out past curfew while their parents wait for them, who gets visits from the tooth fairy, who think they're far too old to be hugged goodbye, who squirm in church and scream on the phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at and whose smiles can make us cry. And we pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime, who will eat anything, who have never seen a dentist, who are never spoiled by anyone, who don't have a loved one to come out to, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move but have no being. We pray for young people who want to be carried and for those who must, for those we never give up on and for those who never get a second chance, for those we smother and for those who will grab the hand of anybody kind enough to offer it. We pray for young people. Amen. benediction. We gathered together from many places and times, and God's Spirit has joined us and gave us God's words to write on our hearts. Go in peace and be God's letter to others. Amen.